Don't read the comments. <laughs> That's the advice that progressive liberals, in particular, share for self-care and good social media hygiene. Don't read the comments. For those of us who frequent social media, where people, news services, and institutions can post articles, reflections, essays, opinion pieces, and news of either the journalistic or fake variety, don't read the comments. The warning is just because a person could get a very skewed idea of humanity when judged only by what bored, angry people might say when empowered by anonymity. The internet, with its vast potential to democratize art, entertainment, and information, is also a cesspool of dysfunction. It's the Wild West, unsheriffed by responsibility or accountability in its pseudo-anonymous reach. Where anyone can say anything, it turns out they will. <laughs> and things that virtually no one would have the bad manners or nerve to say out loud to another living, breathing human being in front of them, will type, send, tweet, and share over and over again. A person can get very discouraged about the future of civilization as judged by the comments. So how do we respectfully engage in this highly emotionally charged new reality and stay true to our own values? I want to share with you today four true online adventures from the past year for your consideration. True story, last year I moved to Stratford. It's a small town with a bit of a dual and dueling identity crisis. Well known for its established arts community, courtesy of the Shakespeare Festival, it's also a really small conservative Ontario town. <coughs> In search of connections and recommendations and local orientation, I joined a local Facebook group. <laughs> it's mixed company, and there are things such groups do really well. And then there's the rest. Don't read the comments. A person of color posted that he had been surprised to visit a local store and saw that they were selling the Confederate flag, proudly displayed behind the counter. It's the symbol of the defeated Southern Army from the U.S. Civil War, a flag still waved and celebrated mostly by the Ku Klux Klan. The person said he pointed out to the sales clerk that he was shocked to see this in Canada and its very presence felt like an assault to him. The person on Facebook said, how do others feel about this? <laughs> <laughs> Don't read the comments. I mean, I should not have read the comments, but I did. And with every scroll, my heart sank toward despair as I read horribly mean, clueless justifications for racism. I have a right to my opinion, they said, but the Confederate flag is history. It's nostalgic. Why do people take it so seriously? It's just a piece of fabric. Get over it. Who cares? But the biggest affront for me, the hook, if you will, was the faux nostalgia in a post from a young man posed with a gun who pined over possibly losing the symbol of his imaginary Southland that he only ever encountered through bad movies and skewed history lessons. Seriously? Now, y'all know I did not grow up in the United States, but my family has deep Texas roots. My relatives fought on both sides of the Civil War. We were Hispanic and English, Native and settlers, slave owners, and abolitionists. Like most U.S. Southerners, ours is a rich and complicated and fraught history. 
So I asked him, oh, I'm a southerner too, where y'all from? <laughs> I knew the answer, and that my southern poser, no surprise, that conversation rapidly devolved. <laughs> So I disengaged from the comments, and I went straight to the source. I wrote a private Facebook message to the store explaining, for people like me, the presence and display of the Confederate flag constitutes hate speech. I will not be able to shop in your store until they are removed. Now, I do things like this quite often. I can't bring myself to stay quiet, even though the chances are next to nil for success. So I was floored, completely floored, when two days later, I received a terse message from the store manager. It was a little testy. She was defensive. She didn't see it my way. She'd only ordered it because someone requested it. but. She had decided to remove the flag from the store and committed to eliminate it from their inventory. She signed off, it's just not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> One email took me maybe five minutes, five minutes because as a writer I tend to overthink these things, five minutes. Maybe mine was the first or the last or the 100th they had received but they removed the Confederate flag from their inventory, and yes, I did go check. <laughs> I posted the store's response to the Stratford page as an FYI, noting, sometimes you win one. <laughs> Some good-natured smack talk ensued. <laughs> A few people from the group immediately friended me on Facebook, and we've become virtual friends as a result. But others, especially the young man pining with his faux nostalgia, piled on the insults. One of them called me a bona fide SJW, social justice warrior. <laughs> <laughs>
Tina, a childhood chum from Gamboa Elementary School in the Canal Zone, Panama, found me online. For a couple of years, Tina and I had been lunch buddies. We were in Girl Scouts together. <clears throat> By some fluke of memory, I recognized her name when she messaged me on Facebook, eager to reconnect. We caught up on where we lived, what our families were up to. We shared a few old forgotten photos and childhood memories. Naturally, we agreed to friend one another on Facebook. That means clicking on mutual permission so we could share personally cultivated feeds of news and reflections and photos. Learning that we dwell on opposite ends of the political and social spectrum was no big surprise to me. But Tina was clear that nonetheless, she valued our connection. I confess that I felt humbled by her automatic hospitality and a bit embarrassed by my automatic caution and cynicism. Right away, Tina was not shy about posting conservative counterpoints to the many social justice posts on my page. She weighed in on poverty, health care, taxes, housing, education, and war. Depending on how offensive I found her remarks, I would ignore, deflect, ask a question, or respond benignly with a kind of textual shrug. You do have a right to your opinion. I guess we have to agree to disagree. We need not think alike to love alike. These are my Unitarian Universalist go-to, let's get along responses. After all, she and I would not be changing one another's minds. And it might have gone on like this for much longer, except that Tina and I happened to reconnect in June. June is Pride Month. So my feed was flooded with celebratory articles, memes, and rainbow flags. Of particular note was an article I shared on June the 8th. The CNN headline read, The LGBTQ pride flag was raised over New York State Capitol for the first time ever. Side note, to make sure I'm not speaking in code. LGBTQ is an abbreviation to denote non-hetero, non-binary identities regarding sexuality and or gender and or none of the above. The letters stand for lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, and I acknowledge that this abbreviation is missing quite a number of letters that we should add in order to be fully inclusive. So I shared this news story. The LGBTQ pride flag was raised over New York State <clears throat> Capitol. This was not just a political milestone for me. This was a significant personal one. Years ago, as a student minister, I had marched through that state capitol building with signs and high heels and determination. I had stood with others in the office as of an assemblyman who was on record opposing same-sex marriage. It was early in my ministerial career, so I was floored, completely floored, when I managed to say the right words at the right time, and in response, the assemblyman stopped, took a breath, and changed his mind, got on the phone, and changed his vote as we watched. To be sure, it was a symbolic victory. It would be many more votes, many more years before real change was made in New York State. But here, 14 years later, hope had turned into history, and the pride flag waved over New York State Capitol. Sometimes you win one. The first comment to my post was from a colleague. 
yeah, we moved. We've come so far, and oh, there's still more to be done. Prophetic words indeed, because the second person to comment was Tina. <laughs> Don't read the comments. <laughs> Really, I had convinced myself not to just read all of the comments to you this morning. We'd be here all day. <laughs> no surprise, Tina is deeply opposed to the pride movement in general and to same-sex marriage in particular. Here were Tina's main objections. Raising a flag on government property declares support of a special interest group, not the whole. Quote, not all citizens support homosexuality, so it serves only to create disharmony and division. Why not raise a flag in support of blonde-haired people? They are born that way, and they are picked on. They are the brunt of many dumb blonde jokes. They definitely are a minority. Raise a flag for them. If you can marry anyone you want to, then why can't I marry my pet beagle? I love my dog. What harm would it do to marry a horse? Why can't I marry a child? Why would marrying a child be morally wrong if I have real loving feelings toward that child? My response was to first come out to her as a bisexual woman so that she could be clear that she was not talking about some imaginary other she'd never possibly met. I asked her to stop using the subject in her sentence as the homosexual and use my name instead to see how it felt for me to read these things. When you speak about them, I said, you're speaking about me. Others called in her into empathy by asking, would you say the same thing about members of another ethnic group? Would you say the same thing about women's rights? Tina sidestepped all those analogies, all those invitations into that personal form of empathy, and instead assured us again and again that she loved everyone. She would help anyone. She's a good person. And we are all on the same team. These were her go-to get-along responses. After a short lull in the debate, Tina presented a lengthy analysis to explain why it, why it all seemed unfair to her. Tina wrote, I think a lot of this began when homosexuals started asking for special concessions. Homosexuals have begun changing what was constant for centuries. It wasn't that the government began demanding something different from homosexuals. It was that homosexuals demanded something different from the law. Homosexuals began verbalizing that they did not want to accept society's generally accepted viewpoint and behavior. They began to demonstrate, to become politically active, to boycott, etc. They decided they had had enough with the status quo, and they demanded change. <laughs> we finally agree on something. I responded, I could not have said it better, Tina, that the word homosexuals is not really as inclusive as I'd like it to be. We did it indeed demand that we have the same rights as you do. We've made a lot of progress. For sure we've challenged the status quo, and I am grateful for the changes made. Oh, she felt insulted by my agreement. <laughs> and the conversation soon devolved into differences of religion. It became more heated and far less interesting, and over the course of the ensuing week, it sputtered toward disinterest and neglect and the way of all things internet. We all moved on to other things. In its wake, though, the conversation has continued to unsettle me. I had struggled over that whole week with whether or not to censor that conversation, whether to remove Tina or some of her more inflammatory posts 
from my page. It was deeply disturbing and uncomfortable. But she had chosen to stay with the discussion, and she's the one who is outnumbered by about 400 to 1. So I have let it continue in a spirit of fair play. And it was mostly fair play. Several people commented and complimented us on how civil a conversation it was in comparison to other, say, Stratford Life pages on the same topic. And I had agreed at the time. But here's what bothers me in retrospect. Was that really a civil <coughs> conversation? What I found still find disturbing and confusing is that Tina said she loved us all as people, but then compared our loving relationships to marrying a horse or a dog. She equated our marriages to bestiality. She claimed it was as immoral as having sex with a child. Let it sink in. She's just called homosexuals pedophiles. But we were all friends, she said. It's just my opinion, she said. We're all on the same team, she said. Aren't we? Back up now. What is it called when someone demeans you but claims it's all in love? That they apologize for offending you but then justify and repeat and double down on that offense? that they take refuge in everyone's right to a personal belief and then politely explain how you people don't have as much worth and dignity, but hey, don't take it personally. <laughs> That's not civil conversation. It's abuse. It's gaslighting. It's hypocrisy. It's not a civil conversation if it involves demeaning and degrading people, however politely and patiently it is couched. That cultural norm, that pull of being polite and patient, masks a great deal of harm that's being done. When it comes to social justice, politeness and patience most often serve the interests of those people who already have power. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing inherently wrong with politeness or with patience. These are excellent virtues, I hear. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the pleas to be polite and patient can be weaponized by people in order to police minorities who are told, don't ask for too much too soon. Don't ask that way. Why do you have to sound so angry? I mean, we've been oppressing people for millennia, what's it been centuries more? <laughs> we find ourselves living in the wake of movements like Black Lives Matter. I don't know more, me too, truth, healing, and reconciliation, climate justice, trans rights, Occupy, Wall Street, to name just a very few. The leaders of these movements are begging those people with some social and economic privilege and comfort to tolerate oppression less politely less patiently. Is that too much to ask? So I've been asking myself how I might have been less polite and less patient during the Pride Flag Facebook debate with Tina, while not compromising my values of maintaining the necessary civilities of compassion and hospitality. I don't have an answer yet. But I did have one final experience that gave me a new perspective, that hint of a road ahead. 
Sometime after the allegedly civil conversation with Tina had dissipated, I chanced across a post from Tina's own Facebook page. It was a link to an article that celebrated an international leader's crackdown on refugees. Tina and her followers commented, pining for their own president, Mr. Trump, to get tougher on refugees. Uh-huh, let that sink in. For this group, Trump is soft on immigration. Now, normally I would not have read the comment, and normally I would not have taken the time to disagree on someone else's page. But Tina had engaged all of us in a challenging debate on my page, and I respected that she had chosen to stay connected. So I took a deep breath, and I commented on the anti-immigration post with a single meme. It was a picture of the nativity scene that pointed out the Christian story of Christmas is the story of refugees who could find no room at the end. No refugees, no Christmas. I braced myself. <laughs> was vile, hateful, threatening, and immediate. But the only reply I cared about was Tina, so I just waited. <laughs> Nothing happened. After a couple of days of silence, I returned to the source, to Tina's page, but I couldn't find it. Not just the post. I couldn't find Tina's page because she had not just unfriended me, she had blocked me. Without comment, I had been deleted from Tina's Facebook existence for posting my opinions on refugees. So much for the assurances of connection and friendship. Now, I'm not naive, but I was genuinely shocked to find that after all of her courageous, if inconvenient, perseverance, that our UU hospitality in engaging in that challenging conversation was not reciprocated. And that, I find, was the biggest difference between Tina and I. Last May, at the annual question box sermon, someone asked me, what does it mean to be an observant Unitarian Universalist? To be observant in a religious sense, meaning to follow the principles of our faith, to adhere to and enact our principles. In other words, what practices, what behaviors, set Unitarian Universalists apart from other communities. I posted that question at my writing desk, and I found it's become a guiding challenge that I propose to revisit throughout this coming year for our collective consideration. What does it mean to be an observant Unitarian? Universalist. This summer, after four online encounters, I formed one part of my response. I believe that as Unitarian Universalists, we are called to stay at the table, not in order to tolerate injustice, but to have a seat from whence we may speak against it. What does it mean to you? to be an observant UU. Let's commit to this conversation because you know, sometimes you win one. Mm.